Hi, I'm Moss here with Hi-Fi Man Sasfara headphones. Now, these took everyone by surprise because we know we all thought the HE1000 at $3,000 was, was the flagship, and now double the price. They have the what appears to be the HE6 successor at $6,000. So everyone's like, oh. And they've Hi-Fi Man has sent out pairs for review, including to me, because obviously they'd rather people talk about how they sound. And obviously, Fung Bian is uh, very proud of how what he's managed to achieve with these rather than people arguing over price. But for the moment, I'm going to talk about the headphones. I don't want to talk about the price. Uh, the H the Sasfaras themselves have share a lot in common with the HE1000 V2s. And you can see my HE1000 V2 re review because it uh, goes into a lot of detail in that. And uh, in that, the, the physical design, of course, is, is apart from the uh, dr driver and the, the cup shape, is, is fairly similar. It uses much the same number of parts. They have the spring steel headband, which appears to be, you know, Stax Lambda inspired, I guess. It uh, has, you know, the leather head pad and the, the clicky adjusters on the side. And it's uh, obviously heavy, heavier than, uh, you know, a plastic design would be, but it's got just about the right amount of spring to hold them comfortably on my head. I'm not going to air guitar on them, they're going to slide around if I try that. But it holds, holds them comfortably without overdoing it. And that's, of course, helped by these, uh, you know, HT1000 V2 style. Ear pads, which seem to be have a mixture of leather and, uh, or pleather, I guess leather maybe, <clears throat> and uh, cloth. And overall, they're very comfortable and they don't get sweaty. And, you know, I can sit listening for a long period of time quite comfortably. So, although they have carried over something to the, from the previous, I mean, I wasn't expecting a diamond encrusted headband or anything, the system does work very well. And, but likewise, you know, stacks were uh, criticized, you know, when the SR009s came out, they were like, oh, it's a Lambda headband, you know, that's just used from their cheapest headphones up to the most, uh, up to, you know, the moderately expensive ones. So that was also a bit of a shock. So they're not the first company to do that. I think where the main difference is, if you've seen Stax SR009s up close, the machining on the metal is just absolutely brilliant. You know, I've got Utopias here, and, you know, all the parts are molded and fit perfectly and, and you know, the, uh, uh, perfect all the way through. You've got your carbon fiber. This is a mixture of steel and, uh, I guess, polished steel and aluminium. And it appears, you know, looking up close, while the fit and finish is good, I mean, the, 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 you have the same plastic insert swivels here, which don't make any, well, a tiny bit of noise on mine, but generally, you know, nothing you can't fix with a bit of uh, dry lubricant. Uh, overall, they appear to be a, a hand finished. Now, the hand finishing, you know, isn't absolutely perfectly i can see kind of a, with a, someone's polished it and, and shaped it and what have you it's not absolutely perfect now given that i live in japan where handmade stuff is just unbelievably perfect you know down to the, the plastic wrapping is perfectly fold you know folded over the box and taped dead on in the middle with exactly the same size piece of tape kind of obsession the, the it seems to be missing the last kind of one percent you know it doesn't quite say this is our flagship in terms of uh fit and finish. I mean, the fit and finish is good. It has ebony wood inserts here. They're flush against the metal. Uh, overall, you know, it's generally very good. It's just, again, that last 1% where you can see some hand polishing marks or what have you, or maybe like the ear pads aren't, you know, quite uniform in their, their final design. It seems that they, you know, they're just, just missing that last little bit that would make them feel like they're a flagship. And also they use the same cable as the HE1000s, the rubber coated cable. Uh, Drew of Moon Audio has kindly, uh, passed me a, a Silver Dragon, which you'll have seen in my HE1000 V2 review. And that has been interesting, which I'll, I'll talk about later. It's been interesting to compare to the, the stock cable. But overall, you know, until you put them on your head, it's kind of like double the price, you know. But again, I don't want to get into that. I want to get into the design. Now, some things you're going to see if you do look at the drivers, you will see some unevenness in the gold coating. Uh, that is because the gold coating is so thin that Fung Bian says it's impossible to get completely even, but it doesn't affect anything sonically. But getting into that, what's mainly different, of course, is the drivers, and they use a very, very insensitive driver, much like the HE6, it's an, uh, uh, a, nanom a nanometer thick driver, gold covered, and it, they use an improved uh, phase alignment system, you can see the black plates in there, which uh, uh, align the phase of the sound coming from the planar drivers. Because planar drivers are flat, uh, the sound coming out, now you'll see normal headphone drivers have a special shape which is designed so that once the sound hits your ear, it's all even between the bass and the treble. With a planar driver, because they're flat, they don't have that, and that's why you need the phase alignment plates to get you know, more precision out of your sound. Now, in that, again, once you get them on your head, all those little fine things don't matter anymore because they do sound really fantastic. Now, it turned out just in, in good time that 
Helmut Becker of Audio Valve sent over a wanted to send over a Solus, Solaris for me to review, which I've got here. This has 12 watts of power output. Now, why we're talking about power output? Because these are like the HE6 before them, very very insensitive headphones. They have around somewhere around the 80 decibel mark of, in terms of sensitivity. Now, for those of you who are uninitiated, uh, the headphone sensitivity is per per milliwatt. And things like Sennheiser's HD800s are about 103 decibels per milliwatt, which is quite sensitive. Uh, IEMs can be higher, 106 or what have you. You know, you get so a few headphones in the 90s, maybe like the Mr. Speaker's headphones, but down at the 80, 80 decibel mark is speaker territory, and so you literally do need a speaker amp for these. They really, really require a lot of power to get the most out of them. Now, my good old Studio 6 does have can do the voltage swing but doesn't have the ultimate output power so that at lower volumes you do get a lot of precision but you know you can't turn it up and, and rock out with them so that's why it was good that the Solaris came along because with the 12 watts of power output it had you know just what was needed and it has impedance adjustment on here so you can actually adjust it towards the headphones you're using and adjusting it to, to match these you'll get the maximum power through them now not maximum power through them obviously blow my ears out but also, I was reviewing decks like the Audio GDs R2R7, uh, I've got the Hugo 2 in here, and uh, so I have a Master 9 in here as well, which has been very interesting as well. So I've got these three amps I could use with them. And sound-wise, my first comparison was with uh, the HE1000s, or the HE1000 V2s, I should say. They are fairly similar in tone, in that it's fairly even, reasonably flat, but there's somewhat of a dip around the mid-range, around the 2 kilohertz mark. I've seen some amateur measurements that have this at minus uh, 10 decibels below the other frequencies. It doesn't seem like it's a very mid, very recessed mid-range. You do not have that kind of forward presence that some headphones do with uh, instruments, but it doesn't see, it's not, in, if anything, it gives more of a sense of space to the music rather than a sense of being recessed or, or very, very colored because the bass isn't like uh, tonally very strong. It's not like, say, Sony's MDR Z1Rs or something like that. It's still fairly even. The treble, on the other hand, now the HE1000 had a fairly uh, strong peak in the treble, and this worked very well with classical music. It had the, give, gave the instruments that just that sense of air that you really needed to get the most out of classical. These have a slightly lower treble, so they tend to be more even and tend to be better all-rounders. They don't have quite the thump that is necessary for some of the kind of dance tracks I, I like listening to, but they have the speed. And holy cow, when you get these into a good amp, they are really really fast and now now that I've had a lot of use with them they're actually getting up challenging the utopias and we I'll get into in a bit but the the initially interesting thing was at first I put them on you know and plug them in and I started getting crackling I was hearing crackling from them and this was out of whatever amp not just the studio 6 or the hugo too which which doesn't have enough power but I was like getting crackle crackle, crackle. I was like what is it? I'm like is, are the amps clipping is something faulty but here's the interesting thing the crackling went away after some use. So, you know you have all those arguments online like a burn-in is, is bullcrap and all that. Well, these needed hours. They crackle. They actually had, you know, crackle, crackle, crackle when you were listening until you put some hours on them. It was very noticeable. This was not like, oh, they sound better after so many hours, which is just obviously debatable. I mean, I do think they sound better after some hours of use because I was constantly comparing between headphones, but the thing is, these definitely need burn-in. It's not, it's not a disputable fact. It was actual funny crackling noises that were going on until I put some owls on them. So that was, uh, you know, something of a shock. But once that happened, and once I, I did put some owls on them, you know, the sound was really lively and fantastic. And it was just like I remember hearing in Tokyo on the big EF1, uh, was the EF1000 amp, and the system they had set up there, really, really super lively dynamics. Now, tonally, of course, they don't have that kind of thick tone you get with the, the planers where they have, you know, flat through the bass and then they drop off at one kilohertz. Because there's somewhat of that dip there, they don't have that thick presence, but they do sound really lively and dynamic. And I suppose because the treble is a little bit bright, especially in more modern music, they're going to sound a little bit peaky and a little bit lively in that sense. And But it was the, through the mid-range, I mean, is the place where you need to really listen. And, and just, it really wants to push detail in your face. And do so with like a, it, it's not... It doesn't seem to me like fake detail, but, you know, real detail coming through. Now, com that's where things got interesting compared to the good old Utopias. Now, the Utopias have become my standard. Uh, they do have their faults, you know, the upper mid-range, you know, could be a bit, they could have a bit more bass, you know, I should switch the ear pads kind of thing. But these were the first headphones to provide, you know, real depth to the music, where you could actually hear the layers of the music on, on a good two-channel recording. And they, you know, they they... 
they get out the, the tiny micro detail out of my shitty drizzle, which is hiding under the desk in case you're wondering. You know, you could really clearly hear the difference between every single component. You know, how good the amp was, how good the DAC was, you know, what it could do, what it couldn't do. And especially with something like the chord DACs, where you do have that sense of layer, the, the sense of depth, they could, you could really make that out, even though they don't have the, the most wider sounding soundstage. And initially these sounded kind of wider than deeper, so they're more like spread out and wider. Maybe it's something to do with that 2 kilohertz dip as well. But they do, you know, everything seemed to be more spread out, but a bit more shallow. And whereas these seem to be a bit narrower and, and deeper. But after time, what happened after some time is I was switching between DACs, and you, you hear more depth out of the Hugo 2 than, than the other DACs I have. And I could make out more of that depth with these after I put some hours on them. And so that was really fascinating. They're catching up. Now, I decided to go ahead with this review, even though I don't have a speaker amp, and Hi-Fi Man wanted me to try them out of a speaker amp, and I think everyone and their dog wants me to try them out of a speaker amp. But I've got enough of an impression of what they can do that I don't feel it's necessary. They, they were so good. Now, between the amps, since you're wondering, the Solaris is really good, really relaxed, relaxed and, and kind of neutral kind of sound, a touch more mellow, and it was really good with the kind of warmer sound of the R2R7, which is only a touch warm of neutral. Uh, for slightly more detail, but slightly more even, there was a Master 9. It's kind of like no, nothing but the facts, but it's kind of a, a little bit less interesting than a good tube amp. You know, I mean, there's a little... I've tuned the you know, selected tubes, which may be a little bit interesting in the Studio 6, and uh, this tends to be... The, the Master 9 tends to be not what is dead flat, is the only thing we offer. And But this could maybe get at a fraction more detail because it was focused purely on accuracy, whereas this is a bit... You know, it's got it's a big tube amp, it's got multiple things it does, it does stacks, it does speakers, everything. It's maybe a touch behind on detail, but it was still very pleasant, and it felt like it wasn't driving, it wasn't doing anything, it was just the music was coming through, whereas this is a bit more nothing but the fact, but, but can get out those really fine dynamics if it doesn't sound quite as, I want the power of this in this kind of thing. I, I like the, you know, just the tiny touch of entertainment and the color. But in that, uh, even music which is more modern, where, like on the dance track I was listening to recently, even though the treble is a little bit brighter, it's not best suited to these, which are, you know, it's a kind of music where it's, it hasn't got them, it's got some instruments in there, but not enough detail that these really, it really gets the most out of these headphones. You know, they really need the Sony, like the Z1Rs with that thumping bass and, you know, maybe imperfection in the sound, but, it, you know, we need just want entertainment. It's the acoustic music, of course, where these came out. And with the mid, it didn't, seemed to matter that the instruments weren't right in your face. I found it quite very very satisfying to listen to. They'd really drive up the, the fine details of the playing, the fine details of the singing, you know, really in your face. And in general, I can't find any particular fault with them, unless you, you know, of course, want to have the, you know, your mid-range in your face. Generally, I, I find them pretty close to faultless. And while I'd probably say the ultimate micro detail probably came out a tiny bit better with the Utopias in the best I could set everything up. These, maybe if I put it, had a big speaker amp, maybe I could get that kind of level out of, out of these that I can out of the Utopias. May well be, but it was getting, it's getting so close now that I can pick up either pair and really enjoy myself. So the first question is, you know, how do they compare to the HE-1000s? And... When I, in my H1000 review, you probably re recall that I felt, well, the cable is good enough, you know, I compared to the Silver Dragon, the Silver Dragon sounds a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more spacious, but you know, I like the stock cable. The interesting thing was, switching to the Silver Dragon this time, I felt there was a, a bit more of a jump up in detail than there was with the H1000 V2s, and so that really kind of nailed it for me in that I felt that you could get more out of these headphones than you can just out of, you know, the stock configuration. And I know cables and all that, but the people who are going to be buying these kinds of things aren't going to hesitate spending some money on a on a on an aftermarket cable if it if it suits them. So stock cable is fine, but you can get it seems to be you can get more out of them, and obviously you can get more out of them with a better amp. So overall, you know, these are just one of the best pairs of headphones I've ever listened with. And you know, I mean the real challenge will be how would they compare with the whole stack system because stacks have their full rig for under under around somewhere around ten thousand dollars now could you compare with that mm, that's going to be a really big challenge because you know the sr009s tend to be you know the the gold standard and they did in tokyo when i compared the two rigs with the hugo 2 it seemed that the magic of the hugo 2 was sounded a little bit better out of this came through more on the stacks rig than it did on the hi-fi man rig but you know i haven't really had spent any time with the f1000 so i don't know how that amp is but all the same, for those, you know, they're just 
the ability to be very finely detailed and be highly dynamic and everything, you know, they really challenge the utopias in the, in being, you know, one of the kings of, of really being able to do that. And again, you know, another pair of headphones I'd like to have here are the Abyss and the latest Abyss 5 because they probably are, are be a really good challenge too and they're up there in that kind of price. And that's where things are the real kicker, you know, $4,000, $6,000, uh, maybe require a new amp purchase. You know, if I had a big speaker amp to begin with, this and, uh, and you know, if I had a big Macintosh speaker amp like a friend of mine does, I probably wouldn't be hesitating so much. You know, I wish, if there were $4,000, we'd be arguing about which pair of headphones is the better buy. We wouldn't be arguing about the price. Now there are utopias you can get for $3,000. Well, I reckon if the HE1000 V2s were around like $2,000, $2,500, and these were $3,000, and these were $3,000, that would be somewhere more realistic to me. And, of course, now with the Sonys are all discounted under $2,000, you know, about fifteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred as much. We have the Odyssey LCD X and XC somewhere around the $1,400 mark as well. Things are going down, not up. And uh, what I was told is that in China, they have to set a high price. So, you know, that people, if it doesn't have a high price, people won't think it's good. But my answer to that is, you know, would you rather have people buying these who are buying them because they're expensive, or would you rather have people buying them if you're a manufacturer because they're the enthusiasts who really want to listen with them? And to me, I'd rather have enthusiasts buy them and not just people with lots of money and have and have more people able to access them because at six thousand dollars they're just not accessible to so many people. So in the end, they are a really excellent pair of headphones, but yeah, what a shame. Most people aren't going to get a chance to ever own a pair or experience how good they are unless, you know, someone just, you know, unless the price comes shooting down. So, really, really fantastic effort from Hi-Fi Man and just, uh, you know, that last 1% and the price. I wish were better and uh, otherwise I'd say yes. Once again, I hope you liked the video. So if you have any questions, comments or criticism, please do comment under the video. And also don't forget to check out my website, headphone-earphone.reviews or the short URL to it, here.reviews, where I have written reviews on all the products as well. Now also, if you'd like to help support my videos, there are some links in the sidebar on the site, as well as descriptions of some of the videos. So if you buy headphones and products through those links, that will help me greatly. Now, for ongoing support, I also have a Patreon where I'll be offering supporters the chance to view behind-the-scenes videos, alternate takes, and other cool stuff such as giveaways, so do check that out. Otherwise, I'll see you online.